Good morning, Oklahoma, and welcome to Cow Calf Corner. This week, in honor of our nation's birthday and our Independence Day, and that great holiday that we celebrate to commemorate the signing of the Declaration of Independence, we don't really look at our nation's history. We're going to look at the history of the beef cattle business in this country. And there's some interesting things to reflect on, and I always feel like it's worth doing because we can learn from history. And part of the take home message as we reflect on the history of the beef cattle business in this country, it's still a relatively new thing. We go back five, 600 years ago, the Spanish explorers, some of the English explorers actually brought Spanish longhorn cattle into North America. And it was those cattle that for a couple centuries really flourished living on the Southern Plains and did quite well in a feral state in the United States. Now, by the mid 1800s, there was some domesticated beef production that took place in Texas and South Florida. And then what really happened is during the Civil War, we found millions of those descendants of Spanish Longhorns roaming the Southern Plains. The American public acquired a taste for beef. Now, most of that public was back along the eastern seaboard and the population centers back east. We had the railways being built into the west. We had the establishment of a stockyards in Abilene, Kansas on a railhead that came there. And the long drives started. The long drives that would have up to 10,000 head of cattle would be rounded up in Texas, come up along the Cimarron River, follow that trail, the Chisholm Trail all the way to Abilene. And there, those steers were worth $10, $20 a head. And if we could get them back to the east, to Chicago, New York, a packing facility, those cattle were actually worth $40 to $80 a head. Now in the 1880s, we began to fence, we began to brand, we began to claim ownership of land and cattle. We had a severe blizzard that wiped out a lot of those longhorn cattle. We began to repopulate the plains with the British breeds. The British breeds, late 1700s and through the 1800s, all came to this country from the British Isles. We're thinking primarily shorthorn breed, the Hereford breed, and even later the Angus breed. For about 50 to 60 years, we selected for more muscle thickness. And up until about the 1950s, we put our selection pressure on cattle that were smaller framed, early maturing. They were thicker and heavier muscled, but our big objective was cattle that could actually reach a market weight and a degree of finish on a grass-based diet. So by the 1960s, the popularity of grain finished beef, coupled with the modern beef industry as we think of it, and a population of cattle that have been bred for decades to be early maturing led to a breeds revolution. By the 1970s, we had dozens of new breeds coming into this country. By the 1980s, we had 70, 80, 90 different breeds that have been imported. We had made cattle a lot bigger, a lot trimmer, a lot later maturing. And in the last 30 years, we began to kind of consolidate breeds again. And really since the turn of this century, about 20 years ago, the breeds that have remained popular, the beef products that are popular, are the breeds that can provide documentation of genetic potential, pedigrees, and good information about the genetic potential of those cattle. What does that tell us about the future? I suggest to breeders to stay on your toes and spot emerging trends and give thought to the past because 50 years down the road we may be breeding types of cattle to meet consumer demand and fit our production environments that are a lot more specific than even what we're doing today. So we can anticipate the future, we can learn from our past. I hope you enjoy this. I'm Mark Johnson. I appreciate you guys joining us on Cow Calf Corner.